Um, good afternoon, everyone. I want to begin by sort of laying out the rationale for this, and then also to let you know that I imagine this same theme will take at least another six weeks and possibly another six after that, because we are dealing in the period between 1850 and 1900 in Paris with so many names that are so familiar and whose art is so well loved now. Uh, and the title was intentional. It's painting in Paris. Not that these are all going to be French artists, but they are artists who were painting in Paris. So there'll be Thomas Eakins, Mary Cassatt, um, Whistler, well, other artists from other parts of Europe as well. So you're looking uh, obviously at Paris now in the period up to 1900, there wasn't the Eiffel Tower to orient you like this, but it was in the years immediately after 1850 that Paris was transformed by these grand boulevards and the, um, the file of relatively similar, same height, absolutely handsome apartment buildings. So Paris underwent enormous changes in the 19th century. And Parisian painting does, especially in the period between 1850 and 1900. Um, I think before we get to the end today, I will be showing you some, I'm certainly hoping to, paintings by an artist who sort of came on the scene in 1850. And then you think in 1900, that's when Picasso made his first trip to Paris because he had to work in an international world's fair then. So it's going to, people think generally of impressionism, but it's, it's kind of a Toulouse-Lautrec, Seurat, Van Gogh, um, and Corot at, at the other end. It's this great span. So the questions, why there, why then? And uh, today we're gonna to start partly with the why there. One is just visible in this uh, image now. Uh, it, <laughs> it didn't look like at the time because this was a, a complete remodeling of Paris in the decade after 1850 by Baron Haussmann to, to make Paris the most modern city um, anywhere in Europe and America. So people coming here were, were coming for um, modernity, for uh, new sanitation, new, new transportation. Um, it was after all the age when people were first flocking to cities when there was now industry, there was mass literacy, there was a great explosion in population. So it's a time of, of tremendous historical change. But it's the conditions in art that are, of course, what we're going to pay attention to most. There, this is a different one of the Haussmann Boulevards. This is by a a Pizarro painting from the late 1870s, <clears throat> and getting you a little closer to the street level view. Um, there's a great building hiding in the background there that appears in works we'll see later, the, the Opera building. But about why go to Paris other than it's being a marvelously invigorating new environment. Well, it was because of the art. And one of the major features of that art was the Louvre. Uh, and this is a painting from late in the 19th century of a gallery in the Louvre. Now the Louvre was um, open to the public just roughly a century before the Metropolitan Museum was founded. And it contained 
collections that the French um, royal family had been amassing since the time of Louis XIV. And in this painting, for example, here you see a Leon, one of the Leonardo's, here's a Raphael. I believe this is a Rubens up here. And this is a Velasquez, I think. Um, would really be hazarding a guess on some of the others. <clears throat> so if you wanted, if you <laughs> have to get out of the modern Zoom age, modern age of reproduction in color to think you had to see the originals to, to be familiar with this art. There were beginning to be photograph reproductions in black and white that were appearing in the increasing number of art periodicals, but to you had to travel to see. So this is one reason people came was to go to the Louvre and Well, our students going to the Louvre had a special value because you studied there. Uh, I remember when I first came to Manhattan, they were still at the Met, I think just maybe one day a week when artists could get permits to go in and set up an easel and, and copy because copying was considered to be the primary way to learn uh, <clears throat> by imitating what you've seen. So here you have a gallery with diligent artists working and then a number of women. Now these women, they are sometimes trying to learn from the paintings that more and increasingly women were used as copyists because it was now where we would have a poster or we'd have a photographic reproduction of something. If you wanted one of these, you hired someone to come in and make a copy. And you'll notice who did this. This is, um, oh, does it say? Yes. Winslow Homer, who was in Paris in the 1860s. He went just for a year. He didn't, well, he studied briefly there, but he had to work on an exhibit there. So he, he spent some time. And this is one of the lithographs he sent home for um, periodical for which he produced lithographs so that people in this country could have a sense of what it would be like to be there. This is a painting by Degas and it shows Mary Cassatt, the back of Mary Cassatt with her sister, her sister reading the guidebook. As you can tell, even from the casual pose and the intentness with which you can tell that she's looking intently at a, a, a painting, that that's Mary Cassatt in the Louvre also. Mary Cassatt will be an extremely influential figure in terms of French 19th century art reaching our shores because her friends, when they came to visit her in Paris, she would take around to dealers and to museums and to her friend, fellow artists, uh, encouraging the Americans to buy their work. So for example, one reason Impressionism is very popular, was popular in this country before it ever was in France is because she was an intermediary. So you had this wonderful repository of art. going even back to the Egyptian antiquities that Napoleon had brought back from his campaigns in Egypt. And you also had a very systematic, very sound, very conservative art education available to you uh, <clears throat> through the state-sponsored Ecole de Beaux-Arts or the you know, School of Fine Arts. And, and this is its um, building in Paris. It's just across from the Louvre on the other side of the Seine. It's uh, still active as you can see from people here. And this is what it would have looked like up into the early 20th century when you entered. The central atrium was lined with statues that are um, plaster 
copies of famous Greek and Roman works of art. And it even has full scale plaster copies of columns and architectural decoration from the Parthenon. That is as good as a manifesto because the school of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts had a very deep seated reference for and insistence upon the greatness of ancient art, meaning Greek and Roman art. Um, and that they encouraged contemporary French students, visiting European students, if they were so lucky as to be able to get into the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, to study and to copy these and to use these as the model that they should follow. So it's a very, um, well, let's put it nicely, a retrospective point of view. Now, getting into the Ecole de Beaux-Arts was difficult. Um, it did, by the 19th century, admit some foreign students, but it didn't admit all the French we wanted in. One thing was that there was a very rigorous French language requirement. So that would weed out almost all people who had not had a good education. And um, there was a very strict kind of lockstep education. Oh, oh, I should also say, no women were allowed until 1897. So what was this education? Students, when they came in, first had to learn how to draw. Now, this is still the standard beginning format in many art schools. You have, that's the beginning of representation. And it was the assumption was that what you're trying to do is, is draw so that you can make a a version of what's the visible three-dimensional world. I'm not so sure that this is a, a drawing from a student at the Ecole, but this is the kind of work it would be. So you um, especially are interested in human anatomy, also somewhat to a lesser degree in animal anatomy, but you learn to draw, you learn shading, you learn the angles, and you would be, so you, draw. And the other thing you might then be allowed to do was to make drawn copies of um, generally engravings of works of art, paintings, because I'm only talking about the painting students. There were also sculpture students and architectural students. But, <clears throat> and the reason you would be copying engravings after paintings is that you're not going to deal with color but you are going to learn how to present a three-dimensional composition. You're going to begin to learn how to create the illusion of going back in space. Something's in the front, something's in back, and this, the way that you know, almost till the 20th century in Western arts from the Renaissance on was thought what a painting ought to do. So you'd have those drawing classes, you did these bits and pieces of bodies on casts, then you could graduate to doing life drawing. Um, and primarily the life drawing would be of uh, um, human beings, generally male figures, also females uh, in the nude. So you could also have been learning how to do that from looking at the and copying the and statues that are out there in the general atrium. So you would do that. Um, if you want to learn to paint, you, you would learn the real rudiments about painting. Not much, because in addition going to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, you would on the side go to one of a number of several, well, maybe three or four major academies where the teachers tended to be painters who also taught at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, but they had this separate enterprise, a large room stuffed with um, easels, um, a modeling stand, and then someone would pose, or there might be a still life or something for artists who perhaps couldn't meet the entrance requirements for the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, 
and for foreign students or for students who just wanted more, they would come in there and then they could, they could work from um, what, was, what was presented for them. So they had a, some greater flexibility there. And there, if their teachers were painters, um, the painters would be teaching them their own tricks, how to mix colors, how to lay the colors, um, what effect this color has with this color, uh, how to use the brushes, all the technical as well as representational uh, tricks of the trade. Those schools didn't charge very much money. Um, there was one called Academy Suisse, not because it was Swiss, but because the man who was in charge, who founded it was, his last name was Suisse. Um, you went there because you could always have a live model. Three weeks out of the a month, there'd be a male live model. And one week there was a female. So you could draw all the time and it was cheap. Uh, and it was open for many hours. So, in, um, so you could work there. There was another one where female students were admitted fairly soon. Um, so that was their workaround. And, and in the major one called the Academy Julian, uh, artists there got a very good education and um, they were also allowed to um, enter competitions for prizes, which is what's going to bring them to the attention of the public. So this is in the Academy, Julian, and I think before the um, end of the time today, we'll be looking at works by the artists who uh, taught here. But you can see this is this is be the men at work. You cram as many in as possible, and evidently these it was uh, almost inseparable to sometimes newcomers coming because the windows would always be kept shut, and especially as you move toward the 80s and 90s, when cigarette smoking was rampant, there would just be a fog of cigarette smoke in here. So the artists are working with the model. Sometimes when you find works on the walls like this, uh, it's not because those are especially fine works by some of these students there as uh, examples. But if you had, say, We'll take this young man here. If he, in this week, did not have the money to pay, he might leave a painting up there uh, as, as a pledge until he got enough money that he could, he could then redeem his painting and continue to work there. And especially from about the 1880s, there were uh, women who could also increasingly work uh, from live models. This is by a woman, a Russian woman um, named Marie Bashkirtsev, who oh, she died by the time she was 25 from tuberculosis. She was a really fine painter. Um, this is not such a good reproduction, but it's her um, illustration of what one of these studios was like. Uh, here is a, someone who's guiding her. She's indicating that she is fairly an educated woman because she has her papers on Le Figaro down here. So she has the paper and there's all her equipment. So you can see these are modest environments in which people are working. Oh, let's see this up for a minute. So you learn. Well, what are you going to paint other than models? This is just for learning. How do, what do you do for a, a general composition? You, you, in the, the whole system under the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, you had um, an agenda. Or if you went to the Academy of Julien, where you could also submit works to the Ecole de Beaux-Arts competitions. There were competitions all year round. Everything was competitive. I mean, they had... Um, Competitions for full figure drawings, for half figure figures, for still life, for historical scene. But the main thing is that every year there would be either one or two pre de Rome 
scholarships awarded. Those were tremendous prizes because they allowed the winner to spend three to five years living in Rome at the Villa Medici, which is where the French school was, still is, um, studying there and then free to travel all around Italy and see the whole wealth of what was there in terms of antiquities and, and contemporary work. More than that, if you, uh, that's here, let me, this is the next one. This is early, This is in the Met, but it's a painter from uh, earlier in the 19th century. He's in his room at the Villa Medici looking out over this wonderful cypress trees and the view into Rome itself. In his room, entertaining himself with music. Um, he has some plaster casts here to copy, some engravings to copy, perhaps some of his works here. So this is the life of a student, the most privileged student. The privilege is not only that he gets to study there, but that his career is as well as made. Because when he comes back, or even from there, if he sends work home, the public is ready to buy it because he's the best. He won the Prix de Rome. Um, and not only is the public going to buy, but the state is going to buy. Sometimes for its sort of regional museums uh, and then other major establishments will. And then so his, his work, spreads. So this is the, the prime goal. And here's a wonderful photograph of the young men and their teachers outside the Villa Medici, the beginning of this century, I think. Now, a little more about the pre de Rome and the whole issue in the bureaucracy of a school like this. The judges for the pre de Rome were men who had previously won the pre de Rome. So you see how conservative the bias is going to be. It's what they were awarded for what they have flourished off doing, they are then going to be most likely to want that in the next generation of artists. Uh, <clears throat> and there was, uh, well, their politics and everything when they're competitions, right? If you were going to one of those other studios and you studied with one particular artist who perhaps had won a Prix de Rome, you're gonna to want to work like his. He's gonna encourage you to work like his. And different winners might have preferences for one student over another student. So there was a tremendous amount of infighting, discontent, uh, tension over all of this. Jacques-Louis David, because this goes back long before the 19th century, in the late 18th century, for three years in a row was denied winning the Prix de Rome. And he, he um, tried to commit suicide for a while, he's starving himself to death. Um, Manet got turned down. Well, many people we look back on and say, oh my goodness, what a fine artist. They were turned down. So now what you're looking at is the auditorium in the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, the room where the prizes of all sorts would be awarded. So these were big public ceremonies and even the decor on the walls, look, see these laurel wreaths and the palm, those are the laurel wreaths of victory. So this is the room expressly to celebrate winning. And this is the mural, so something like 80 feet long, that circles all the room except that part we see at the front. And I'm gonna show you several parts of this. This is from the 1830s, early 1840s by a painter named Paul Delaroche. And it's called The Painters of All Ages because this lays out, it makes very explicit what their standards, what their desires were for um, someone trained at the Ecole. 
is an amazing, amazing painting. So here at the center, there are three, and I've got a close up of this, two close ups, you'll see. Three men in toga. So, okay, this is classical antiquity. <clears throat> they represent the architect, the sculptor, oh no, the, the architect, the sculptor, and the painter of the Parthenon. So they are the greatest of the judges because their work is the greatest. And then there are four female personifications here, and you'll see this in a moment. And they represent the four great periods in the history of art. There's someone from ancient Greece, ancient Rome, the Middle Ages, and the 16th century. And kneeling down in front is the woman who represents glory. And she has a whole pile of laurel wreaths. That's the wreath handed out by Apollo for victory in the arts. And all the rest of these figures, 66 of them, were chosen by Della Roche himself as being 66 of the greatest painters, sculptors, and architects from the medieval period up to the 19th century. So there, you male student at the, at the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, this is what you should strive to be, to earn a place up there. So here the center. It's a, a inadequate reproduction, but I think it's someone visitor just took it. Um, now I think well, let's see. I'll give you these fellows in the beginning, but first you see the the women here. So they're. This is, I know, the crown is Roman. This is a Greek dress. This is like a Titian-esque figure, a well-hidden, maybe Gothic figure with a little Gothic cathedral here beside her. So even the idea for these men, bare-chested and um, only discreetly covered here for the young man, uh, wearing their laurel wreaths, where does the idea for that come from? And notice their sandals, very elaborate sandals. That's copying classical sculpture. This is actually a Roman copy of a Greek sculpture of a Greek philosopher. But the idea of the older figure, uh, bare um, chested, the, the robe over shoulder and those sandals, because the model is always not today, but the ancient world. Yet, I hope you find it is like unsettling as I do. All right, so that's the source of the pose. That's the source of the gravitas in these figures. But don't they look like models who just posed on the platform for someone? They are too lifelike in the rendering of the figures. So there's this uneasy combination of borrowing something from antiquity and then presenting it in a style that's almost like photorealism. And that is the new style of the years around 1850. And don't these various painters and sculptors and architects look as if they were figures dressed up for a, a fancy dress ball. So it has too much particularity to, to, to be absolutely in accord with ancient work. But another feature of this time is that this is the time when the camera is developed. So, um, it isn't that paintings become very realistic because the camera is showing them how to do that. They just seem to be developing um, simultaneously that interest which manifests itself in the camera and in this new style of painting. Well, even if you didn't win the Prix de Rome, which gives you your cushy life ahead of you, you had a way to reach the public because uh, <clears throat> There was annually the Salon, the Grand Salon, which is called the, mm, the Exhibition of Works of Living Artists, held annually, generally in the spring, 
um, sponsored by the Ecole de Beaux Arts and by the Academy of the Arts, um, where students again had to compete for their works to be shown. And this is a, I'm going to show you this painting again in a moment, but this is a photo, a photograph, early photograph showing you this one's maybe late 18, well, a little after 1850 anyway, um, the way the paintings would be shown. This is now called a salon hang or a, the paintings are what's called skied. You cover absolutely every inch you can with the works of art. Can you see them? Oh, no. Uh, fortunately, the small ones are right down here, so you get to see those close. But then because this is the way that they would be shown, you can see the temptation there would be for any artist who could afford it to make a painting that's very big because it's going to draw attention or to make it rather simple or you work your colors because you have always in mind that you wanted to get into this competition. Now, we are going to be look at, say, the Impressionists. Poor fellows, they could never get a work accepted in this show. Um, and, and the Salon is going to lose its prestige and sort of vanish from the scene by the end of the 19th century because it has such a chokehold uh, on um, the public awareness of works of art. And I am going to now, we'll take it from that just a little bit to get a sense of what it's like. This is an early photograph actually by the portrait photographer Nadar of the artist uh, Honoré Daumier, who lived into the 1870s. Uh, it shows the downside of this art system. There's Daumier um, came from Marseille. His, uh, very modest Meads family, moved to Paris because his father was very interested in politics and also writing, and he wanted to, to break into the literary scene. He could not. And the, the family wasn't destitute, but they are really poor. So Nadar could not afford this art education. Uh, fortunately, they had a family friend who was able to teach Nadar how to draw uh, because he was very interested in visual arts. And then Nadar went to one of those cheap studios at Studio Suisse, where there were, um, you, could, you could get three weeks of a nude male and then one week of a nude female to draw. So he could practice his drawing there, you know, picking up tips from fellow students alongside him. But his career, uh, at least initially, was almost precluded from being painting because he wouldn't be able to afford it. He didn't have the training and he didn't have the access to buyers. So he became a printmaker. He worked in lithography and he worked with one publisher who was a political radical or, um, and also a um, cultural critic. Uh, this is one of the works, th this is in, from the 1830s, so we're, we're creeping up on something right now. But this is this is one by by um, Daumier that had a very decisive effect on his career because it's a satirical cartoon on the king at that time, Louis Philippe. And it's, it's called Gargantua. Oh, Gargantua is this figure of this gluttonous appetite. So he's showing the king who had an odd shaped, pear shaped face anyway. And then these are all the poor pouring their coins into baskets, which are being trudged up here to go into his maw. And then he's going to excrete them in uh, legislative documents, political documents, and fatten his followers over here. So it's a statement about how the poor are being rendered destitute to make the rich richer. This didn't get very much publication because the, um, the king's censors took it right off the newsstands and Daumier and his the publisher and the um, 
So yeah, I think the owner of the paper, all three of them ha had to appear in court and they were sent to jail for six months. And they were also then put in very strict um, censorship against political cartoons. Here's another one he did in the 1840s. Uh, so I think one that might be more familiar to people because it's, it's still of a very, it's a historical record. It's not a scene he saw, but there had been a, a riot in a Paris working class street where when the, I think it was the National Guard was marching through the street. They had, there had been a riot, not even in Paris, but the, people in the this apartment building, I think it was lobbed stones, maybe shot at the National Guard marching through. And in turn, what the National Guard did was came into this building, they stormed into the apartments and they just killed people wholesale. So that's what he's presenting in this. So had he his way, he probably would have been a strongly political contemporary artist and he will later be called a realist and we will return to his realist paintings. But what you see now are works he did about the annual salon because the salon was a great deal in Paris. Um, it was the height of the social season. Everybody wanted to come, couturiers, sent out their new designs for the year on women who came to the salon. Uh, it was where you went to see and be seen. And you have all these artists frantically working, trying to get by the jury. Um, in one year, we'll come to when this year is, 3,000 works were rejected. So you have some idea of the intensity of the pressure around this. So Daumier, in a, this, um, newspaper of primarily caricatures, uh, annually attends the salon and he does wonderful drawings, skewering both artists and the public because art to the French, unlike, um, well, except for one city in Germany, there was no place else where the visual arts so drew public attention as it did in Paris. I mean. People want to know what was on. There were now writers who began to develop careers because they were writing public articles in the newspaper, doing a critique of the shows. It wasn't just like an art columnist is now. They, uh, they were sometimes aware if they backed the right people and might be building their careers. So the whole industry of art is, is developing. So here what you have is an, an atelier the last week before an ex exhibition. So you see three men frantically working, trying to get this finished. And of course, it's going to be a female nude. And she, I'm going to tell you now, she looks a lot like a Titian nude. And so there's one, I have a whole bunch of them here. Ah. And this is a too sad but true story. This is the triumphal march. So here comes the artist who's created several paintings that are quite large. He has to have uh, hired men to help him trudge to bring them in for the day when the judging is done. And he's carrying to himself. You see how excited, how expectant he is. And then the sequel, the funeral march. Rejected, 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 rejected. For many artists to be rejected like that, especially if it occurs several years in a row, that's essentially the end of their career. Here an artist <laughs> say, they refuse this, the ignoramuses. So there's one indignant one. And, and again, the despondency, look here, marching down the street after the end of this day of the judging. This one, let's see, what does he say for this one? Um, ungrateful nation, you'll not have my masterpiece.
this is quite a veristic drawing, but it's showing um, an opening. The first day of the opening of the show, of the salon, that is, is called the varnishing day because artists for the last chance could get in and put um, finishing touches and varnish their paintings. Maybe they want to change a little bit of color so it stood out more against the ones next to it. And you see the crowd um, coming, how this is, this is such an extraordinarily social event with, well, <laughs> there are many openings like that now, aren't there? Or this is a slightly earlier drawing by some, this is not a Daumier, where you see artists still putting those last touches, even on the skied paintings way up here. A few guards to make sure that decorum is maintained. And only the creme de la creme of society and government was allowed to come to this day. Then some more. Here, the look of the salon on the opening day. Nothing but true connoisseurs, a total of 60,000 people. Now that was not a hyperbole. There were 60,000 people who came. So uh, everybody who came was given a little booklet that had um, numbered and all the paintings were numbered. So you'd look up your number and it would say the name of the artist and it would give the name of the work of art. Um, uh, yeah, let's see what I have here. So this fellow examining one of these lower ones, <laughs> he's looking over here. <clears throat> he says, well, if you look at this closely, you might end up finding one quality, the color. So they're very critical. An artist examining the work of arrival, oh my God. So Domier is having fun with both the artists and the public because he is alas himself an outsider. And then this is, ah, oh, for once here's a composition that's really insane. And then there's an artist here. There goes that bourgeois cretin. So the, Antagonism. <laughs> Excuse me, madam. These nudes are revolting. Uh, I'm going to come back by myself <laughs> another day. <laughs> because that's one thing you could be sure that they were, especially the men would like us if you had a lot of nudes. There was one, one year it was just called the Salon of the Nudes because almost everybody had done paintings of nudes. The promenade of the influential critic. You see the deferential artists on either side in the hauteur of the critic, because they know how much their reputations are spread or damaged by him. So that gives you the way Daumier's idea of the public looking at him. There was another occasion when people would be observing all the um, works of many because, um, well, I don't know how many there were, but about every 10 years or less than 10 years, uh, Paris from 1855 on had an international world's fair. And they would have a gallery of paintings just by French artists and, and one of uh, foreign artists. That's Picasso had one in the room for foreign artists. Uh, so that's the structure. And this is one of the rooms in it, where again, of course, the paintings are all skied. And painters, had, I mean, public had other access because there were now many print sellers. And uh, Daumier later on does these several paintings of, um, just as now you can walk along the um, banks of the Seine and go by many print sellers. So you see the interested public. And it becomes part of social life. Here you have men who have, well, obviously the Afford a collection, 
but they're sharing their collections of prints. And these are much more flattering, aren't they? Because they're they're flattering to the lookers. These are these are men who are truly enjoying the works they have before them in the connoisseur. He's admiring his copy of the Venus de Milo, which was now in the Louvre. And he has a portfolio of prints. So he can admire his culture and his cultured acquisitions. So back to this view of the salon. I want to show you this particular very large painting. It's in the Musée d'Orsay right now. Uh, and I'm which I show you, man, looking at it now. And this is by, uh, this is a painting from 1847. So it's a little bit cheating on the date here by an artist named Thomas Couture, C-O-U-T-O-U-R-E. And it's the Romans of Decadence. This is an example. Oh, it's very much admired in the salon. This is an example of the kind of work produced by men trained in the école who then taught in the école. And let me just explain a little of what the allure was of this. One is it's technically, it's polished, beautiful, anatomy's fine, perspective is fine, the handling of color is fine. This man has all his chops in terms of being an artist. And then the subject. Well, it's something out of classical antiquity, and we know how that that is the source of all good. But it also has a moral lesson in it, because over here, there are two onlookers. Now, those men are northerners, Germanic types. This is... Um, it's called the Romans of the Decadence. And the message is that when the Romans were no longer fighting, they gave themselves over to this kind of life of, of sexuality and alcoholism and dancing and just total dissolute life, which let them then fall to the German people of the North. So there is a subtext here of a moral lesson for all observers, which is to maintain the strength of character, maintain your army, maintain the standards of your society. Or you could simultaneously say, oh, look at that gorgeous nude. Oh, look at that nude. What a handsome back that man has. You could admire all the physicality, all the sexuality, but it's still remotely in the past. So he is able to reach several audiences at once. Another audience he reaches, especially among the judges, is that a number of these figures are actually as if they are ancient sculptures that have come to life. The poses, and well, these are, I mean, I even say that that's one of, of an existing statue of, of um, Julius Caesar, but um, this is the Barbarina Venus, you know, the, these are recognizable figures. So he's showing his knowledge of the classical antiquity too. Now, I'll tell you who one of his pupils was, Manet. Manet rejects this way of painting. And in fact, Couture was more lenient with his students, more accepting of their various ways a painting than the works that he produced himself. And I want to show you one more as a kind of a, how did all these young men deal with the kind of stress and strain uh, placed on them? Well, they had fun. They didn't have much money, but they had fun. So do you see how they are enacting this up here? They're somewhat mocking this 
standard to which they're being held. But I also want to say this, bring this in because this is, um, you know, saying this, this new art is so, so incredibly like photographically real. This is the, it, it works both ways that this is the time when tableau vivant were first popular. Well, most of the 19th and early 20th century as a parlor game and in many other contexts where people would act out works of art. So human beings are then turning themselves into paintings and we have paintings that are looking like human beings. So that's what these, these goofuses are doing here. And with the last 10 minutes, we have someone who's definitely not a goofus, Bougereau. Now, of course, I can't see all faces. So I don't know if there are great grins going on your face. And, oh, I know him. Oh, I love him. Or not. Degas and Monet, supposedly at some point, said that they, um, they were fooling around, that they thought Bougereau would be the most famous 19th century art by the year 2000. And here he is. He was in the 19th century, most certainly the most famous, most prosperous of all painters, adored in the United States, selling all over the Western world. Um, his career was nothing but the ascendant. So here's a portrait of him when he's young, somewhat older. And when he taught at that academy, Julian, and it was his studio that one of the men um, crowded in around the model. So he had a very long life. He painted 800 and some paintings. And I want to show you some of his work. Uh, there's another point that could be made by this photograph you have a sense how become, despite all the challenges of reaching a public, look how many people there must be, because this is a fairly narrow slice of age here, and this isn't the only um, studio, how many people were wanting to become artists in this newly middle-class society. Bouchereau, one thing quite wonderful about him that he encouraged women as well. Uh, late in his life, when he what, even won the Legion of Honor, the highest honor that France, can, France could award to any citizen, he was, uh, he sort of put his reputation on the line, insisting that women be allowed in now into the um, Ecole de Beaux-Arts, that they should have uh, equal opportunities with the men. So just start and then some more next time of his paintings. This is one by him, Dante and Virgil and Hell. And this is 1850. He submitted this for the Prix de Rome. He didn't get it, not for this. It's big. Uh, let's see, it's uh, at nine feet high. So it's a theme from literature. Now, often the painting, the theme for the exhibitions, they had to come from classical or, well, considered rep representations of um, literary masterworks, but not, not religious works, but or, or classical mythology. So this is from Dante with Johnny Skeeky here, chewing on the Adam's apple, two men forever, in I think it's the eighth circle of hell. And here's Dante and Virgil back here. So Bourgeois was sure that he would win because this was the kind of subject that was liked. And Bourgeois was then famous later, I mean, among everyone for the quality of the way he does hands and feet and skin. He shows off such a knowledge of human anatomy. Actually, he kind of exaggerates the musculature here. And he, 
much later in his life told an American critic, he said, oh, if he'd gone on doing paintings like this, he'd have never gotten rich because it's just so melodramatic. But that's a young man's melodrama. And in the same year, oh, God, he did this and this won the prize. So, yeah, okay. It comes from, I'm not even going to give you the title, but it comes from a Roman historian <clears throat> about an Armenian king who's being pursued by the enemy. And with his wife, he, he, he kill, thinks he kills her and throws her in a river rather than having her fall to the enemy where she would be taken as a slave. But some shepherds rescue her, revive her, and then she's uh, freed. So this, here she is, pallid, just out of the water with her limp draperies and the shepherds around her. Again, look how many ways you can show a figure from the front, chest from the front, the back, old, youth, clad, clad, but you can see the full figure underneath. It's, um, he's displaying everything he can do. I brought this in also, not just because he won that, because in the imagery, I was able to find um, one of his um, oil sketches for it. Because he was extremely methodical, uh, methodical, very meticulous, and this he taught to his students. That you do many, I'll show you one, where he does careful drawings, and then he does many color studies as he's working it up toward the end. Here's a flagellation of Christ he does. And the drawing. Unbelievably detailed drawing. I think I'm, I guess I'll leave you with one, this last Christian one, subject matter, and then we'll see some more of his next time. But because I want to read to you a quote that's on the a painting that's in the Met by Bouchereau from someone in the late 19th century, a critic said, whoever gets a picture by Bouchereau gets the full worth of his money in finished painting, in first-rate drawing, and a subject and treatment that no well-bred person can fault. As I say, he was enormously popular. And then here's a modern writer. He painted portraits of photographic verisimilitude, slick and sentimental religious works, and coyly erotic nudes. His work is irredeemably empty and vulgar. So how's that for two diametrically opposed views of this same so very popular artist? See, people were actually treating Bouchereau as that angel there. And this one is still frequently copied, this Annunciation. And he shows, and to the public who are aware, there would be an appreciation of this, he shows a knowledge of, this is like one of those Greek statues, the way this skirt is, from, that's in the courtyard of the, in the atrium of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts, same here. This is like Northern Renaissance painting, the Virgin is like a rose without thorns. Um, so there's this, it has motifs. It, it ties it into all different eras in the past. So, so it seems to have this wonderful pedigree to build on what's important. And then what's new is the purple of her skirt. I'm going to call this angel, she. This is a new color. It's a chemical color. This was very famous, and he made it 
for various collectors who wanted it in various sizes. And that's where we'll start next time. All right, um, so we'll do uh, more Bougereau and then the antithesis to this will move into Courbet, who's radically no, it's the world of re and now. As it is among the peasantry, among the impoverished, as well as among the wealthy. That is the right subject for art. None of this escapist stuff. <clears throat> so we will escape this for now. And um, does anybody have a question or want me to leave on sharing to look at anything before? Nope. All right, I stopped the share. To leave you somewhat stunned looking at that. <laughs> well, I, I want to thank you for doing this. And, and <laughs> you're going to miss that. <laughs> and, and you shocked me. I, I've been looking forward all week to a class on French painting and I never heard of Bougereau, which is my ignorance. No, um, it's everybody's ignorance, believe me. You oh, see, well, that's it. Because we think of French painting as Impressionism. Well, yes. <laughs> and in the time it was done, Impressionism, what's that? Right, right. Yeah. yeah. Well, I was I was happily ignorant of Bougereau, let me put it that way. <laughs> but thanks again, Maggie. You're you're a, you're a jewel. <laughs> well, we have one coming next week that's really good. Okay. Watch, watch your appetite before that. <laughs> Maggie. Yes. My grandfather was in Paris at that time, but unfortunately, he didn't tell me any stories about it. He went <laughs> to boarding school in Paris, and then he lived there for a little bit, uh, um, just before the turn of the century. I think um, it really must have been just astonishing for all those students, especially they're living on nothing in garrets, and, and they have they're really putting so much on the line, you know? So are you just going to go... It, it makes you think more about like Monet, Mole, that they are willing to, well, Monet had money. So in Degas, they could, they were freed and they didn't need the bottom light support of, of this stranglehold that the, that the, um, the Col de Beaux Art had on people. Like, this is what good art is. And you know, if you're told this is what good art is, you go to the show, oh, oh okay, oh, that, that's what I'll get because I know I'm getting good art. Yeah. Pretty wild. Okay, well, see you next week.